series entitled The Famine of God's Word, a series of studies on the Old Testament prophet Amos. And here's Pastor Worsby. And now we pause to pray. Thank you, Father, for the Word. We say this every time, but we mean it from our hearts. Where would we be without the Word of God? It's the lamp that guides us, and it's the food that nourishes us, and it's the sword that defends us, and the water that cleanses us. We just rejoice in the Word. Now help us to learn from it, and help us to practice what we learn, and to do so out of hearts that are grateful We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for his sake, amen. The prophet Amos is up at Bethel. This is where the king had his special chapel. And everybody rejoiced because Jeroboam II was such a religious man. But actually, the religion in Israel was just a facade. It was shallow. It was not real. People were going through the motions They were singing and going to concerts, and they were going with their sacrifices. And so God took uh, Amos of uh, Judah and sent him up to Israel and sent him, this ordinary farmer, herdsman, right into the king's chapel, and he's preaching the word of God. Now, while he was announcing judgment for the Gentile nations, the congregation was quite pleased. Amos started in Amos 1-3, and he judged the Syrians, and then the Philistines, and then the people of Tyre, and Edom, Ammon, and Moab, even Judah. The people must have looked at each other and said, my, didn't uh, Amos come from Tekoa down there in Judah, and here he is uh, condemning his own nation? Well, this doesn't mean that Amos was not a good patriot. He loved his nation, and that's why he pointed out the sin. But in Amos chapter 2, verse 6, when Amos the prophet started on Israel, that was a different story. What does he do in Amos chapter 2, verses 6 through 16? Well, he presents Israel's sinful present in verses 6, 7, and 8, their glorious past in verses 9 through 12, and their terrible future in 13 through 16. He deals with the present, the past, and the future. Let's look at the present. Amos chapter 2, verse 6, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not turn away its punishment. Now, he begins to list the sins of which they were guilty. Because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. He's talking here about their injustice. They are taking bribes that the poor and the innocent might be found guilty. In other words, they want to buy themselves a pair of sandals. They need a new pair of shoes. They want some silver. And so here we have uh, crooked lawyers, crooked judges, crooked officials in the government who are taking bribes to hurt the poor. By the way, it's interesting to see how much Amos has to say about this sin of exploiting the poor. Chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. He's talking to the women who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy. Here are the women saying to their husbands, make more money. Get all you can out of those poor people so we can have more wine and more drink. Chapter 5 and verse 11. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, for what purpose? Though you have built houses of hewn stone, robbing the poor to build their own houses. Chapter 8 and verse 6. That we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. They're selling all the poor products to the poor, and then they're taking money that hurts the poor. Uh, Verse 6 of chapter 8 parallels, doesn't it? Chapter 2 and verse 6. Throughout the book of Amos, the prophet is crying out against their treatment of the poor. Now, he knew that the Old Testament law commanded them to care for the poor. Deuteronomy 15, 7. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart 
nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. He's talking here about specific regulations of the land and the harvest, but the principle applies to all of us, doesn't it? We don't have to be under old covenant law to know we should love the poor and we should not allow them to be exploited. Exodus chapter 23, verse 6, you shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked, and you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. He goes on to say you should not uh, cause trouble and oppress the stranger. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon had a good deal to say about caring for the poor. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 31, He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. Uh, Proverbs is a book that talks a great deal about being kind and helpful to those who are needy. Chapter 17 of Proverbs and verse 5, he who mocks the poor reproaches his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. They're injustice. It gets worse now. Amos chapter 2, verse 7, they pant after the dust of the earth which is on the head of the poor and pervert the way of the humble. That word pant after can be translated trample. They trample the poor into the dust and they are trying to get everything they can out of the poor. A man and his father go into the same girl to defile my holy name. Well, they had immorality back in those days. This is probably some form of incest to think that a father would be such a bad example to his son, or a son would be so arrogant in his sin that he'd take his father along with him. How low can we get when whole families dedicate themselves to sin. What a bad example. What a terrible, terrible defilement of God's holy name. Injustice and immorality. And then he also talks about idolatry. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge. Let's stop right there. Every altar, there was only one altar that God accepted. That was the altar in the temple at Jerusalem. Alas, Israel did not go down there. They went to Bethel, Dan, they went to other places to worship. They had altars all over the place. Why? Because they were worshiping Jehovah God plus the gods of the heathen. They were not doing what God wanted them to do, and they were sinning at the altar. They drank the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. They take money in the court from people who ought to be set free. They take money bribery. Then they go get drunk and go to the heathen altar to visit a prostitute. Now, how much sin can you put together in one place with one person? Oh, you say it's not going on today. Worse than that is going on today. They keep the garments of the uh, poor people taken in pledge. Now, they aren't supposed to do that. According to the Old Covenant law in Exodus 22, 26 and Deuteronomy 24, when you took a garment for a pledge, you were supposed to give it back at sundown because the poor man needed his garment for his sleeping. And then the next day you could pick up that garment again. God was very careful in the way he assigned the laws in taking care of the poor. Injustice, immorality, idolatry, all wrapped up with drunkenness, and this is done at the altar. Their religion was polluted, their sinful present. Now, having exposed their sinful present in spite of all their religion and all of the buildings that they had and the prosperity, he then turns to their glorious past. You know, one of the best ways to get under conviction and repent is just to stop and think of how good God's been to you. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. That's what woke up the prodigal son while he was out there feeding the pigs and hungry. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare. Here I am, his son. If the hired servants are well taken care of, certainly the children are well taken care of. My father's a generous man. I'm going home. 
And so the prophet Amos says, you have forgotten how good God has been to you. He reviews here the history of Israel. Now, Amos may have been an ordinary layman. He did not attend the schools of the prophets. He was not especially a part of that group, but he was God's called prophet. He may have been a layman, but he knew his Bible. I thank God for laymen, laywomen in our churches who know their Bibles. In fact, I have met people in churches who know far more about the Bible than those who have been off to school. Again, I'm not uh, condemning education. I have taught at two different schools, and I have been a part of lecturing at schools. I'm in favor of education. I thank God for the training he enabled me to get. But when God wants to, he can call somebody who's never been to those schools, doesn't even know their names, and he can use that person for his glory. So he did with Amos. Their glorious past. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. He was as strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. And it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. Let's stop right there. He talks about the Exodus, how that God had redeemed them. He mentions this again in chapter 3, verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt. Now, that was a marvelous miracle and a tremendous act of redemption. He brought them out. He led them through. He destroyed the Amorite. He destroyed the Moabites and all the other ites that were there in, in Canaan land, the Hittites and the Jebusites and so forth. He destroyed them, and he led the people into the land. He defeated the nations in the land of Canaan, and he did it because of his wonderful, wonderful grace. God went before them. God led them out. God brought them through. God brought them in. And then when they got into the land, he gave them his prophets. Verse 11, I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. The word Nazarite means to separate. The Nazarites were the people who, in dedication to God, would not have anything to do with the grape. They would not eat raisins or grapes or even a little skin of the grape. They did not drink wine, they were not allowed to touch dead bodies, and they were not allowed to get a haircut. And they were a living sacrifice, a living reminder of dedication to God. I thank God for people who are called to special dedication. Then he raised up preachers, he raised up prophets. What a tremendous thing that is. Are you praying that God will raise up from your family, from your church, people men and women, to teach the Word of God, to be missionaries, to be pastors and teachers and workers. We need to do that. I had a great-grandfather who prayed that there would be a preacher of the gospel in every generation of our family, and there was. There is. I thank God for it. I hope it will continue, and we pray it will continue. Now, he raised up prophets. He raised up Nazarites. He said, hear the Word of God and live the Word of God. Well, what did they do? Is it not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. Now, here's an interesting thing. They wanted the Nazarites to compromise, and they wanted the prophets to stop preaching. We have here liberalism and compromise. We have this today. Somebody dedicates his life to the Lord, and somebody comes along and says, oh, don't be such an extremist. I mean, that was all right for 50 years ago, but not in the jet age, not in the nuclear age. No, no, marriage is not that way today. I mean, that's the way it used to be. There are always those who are saying to the prophets, be quiet. Don't give us the Word of God. We've been saying here at Back to the Bible, and we're going to keep on saying it, we have a famine of the Word of God today. Oh, there's a lot of preaching going on, but there's a famine of hearing the Word of God and of practicing the Word of God. And then you find a Christian who wants to be dedicated. They don't want to get involved in the things of the world. They don't want to get involved in sin and pollution and defilement. And somebody comes along and says, oh, don't be such a... Uh, don't, don't be that way. Don't, don't be such a radical. I mean, you can, you can compromise a little bit. And these two things are killing the church today. Compromise on our convictions on separation, compromise on the preaching of the Word of God. Liberalism, compromise, that's what's killing the church today. Then he launches into their terrible future, verses 13 through 16. 
You see, you can't reject the Word of God and get away with it. You can't compromise conviction and get away with it. You can't say to those who are serving the Lord, now don't be so extreme. I mean, let's be a little balanced about this. Behold, I am weighed down by you as a cart is weighed down that is full of sheaves. There's a farmer talking. All of the illustrations that he uses in his uh, book come from the out of doors. They come from the, the life close to the ground, close to the land. Here's a man whose values were right. He said, God feels the burden. God is crushed by the load of your sin. Amos said, I am crushed by the load that I'm bearing, because the name Amos means to be burdened, to carry a burden. By the way, have you ever stopped to think of how your pastor, your Sunday school teacher, the leaders of your church are burdened? How maybe your grandmother and grandfather are burdened for you? They may just be weighted down. They're at the place in life where they ought to be enjoying life, but instead their children, their grandchildren are just weighing them down with the burdens because they are not living for the Lord. Well, God and Amos were crushed by the load, and yet the people were complacent. Chapter 6, verse 1 of Amos, Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. There's where we are today as a church, at ease. Not at attention, not in the battle. No, no, we're at ease. We're taking it easy. The key word in the Christian vocabulary today is enjoy. Enjoy worship. I wonder how Isaiah enjoyed worship in Isaiah chapter 6 when he saw what a sinner he was. I wonder how John the Apostle enjoyed worship in Revelation 1 when he saw the Lord Jesus and fell down at his feet as a dead man. We want to entertain, we want to enjoy, at ease in Zion, don't get too stirred up. Oh, says the prophet, we're weighed down. Therefore, flight shall perish from the swift. In other words, there's no escape. The runner is not going to make it. The strong shall not strengthen his power. Even if you can't run, you can stand and fight, but his strength will be not worth a thing. Nor shall the mighty deliver himself. He can't save his own life. He shall not stand who handles the bow. You say, well, I can't run, I can't fight, and I can't stand, but I can sure use my weapons. He said, no, the bow won't be of any use. The swift of foot shall not deliver himself, nor shall he who rides a horse deliver himself. The nation of Israel was very proud of its um, military establishment. They really had an army, and they had the equipment. And you know what uh, Amos is saying? He's saying the most energetic will not make it, the best equipped will not make it, the most experienced will not make it. Verse 16, the most courageous men of might shall flee naked in that day, says the Lord. What day? the day when judgment comes to Israel. And it came. It came. The Assyrians swooped down upon Israel, took them, and that was the end of the ten tribes of Israel. Now, God knows where they are, but that's not the point Amos is making. He is saying, you have a terrible future before you, in spite of your military, in spite of your experience, in spite of your courage, in spite of your equipment, in spite of all of your energy and ability, you can't run, you can't stand, you can't fight, and even the horses won't save you because judgment is coming. God speaks to us today and he says, what are you trusting? Is there sin that needs to be dealt with? And we need to say, Lord, is it I? Thank you for listening to Back to the Bible. Join us again tomorrow. God bless you.